As we record, there has been a, a brand new announcement on, on the, the new 99-year leaseholder for our powers and poles, for the what of a better term, <laughs> Transgrid. Yep. Uh, and and that, uh, that we're seeing this, this multinational effort to, to take over the, the running of that resource for the state. On the one hand, that was already a tricky enough proposition, but you got the imprimatur for that at the last election, so went ahead um, with great gusto because it was always on your heart that this would be the way to go to fund much of the endeavours for this state. What's the response been like uh, immediately after that announcement that, that we have a buyer, that we have somebody who's willing to lead this conversation? Well, I think it's been very positive. I think, I think what, what it does is... In simple terms, when people have heard us talk about the infrastructure spend, uh, at the back of people's minds, they say, OK, well, this government does seem to be doing what it says it's going to do. And I mean, things like the North West Rail Link, which are always promised, well, that's well underway so people can see it. But uh, we made no apologies for a very bold infrastructure plan to go beyond um, just the existing projects, but a huge array both across Sydney and New South Wales. And I think in the back of people's minds, they're saying, OK, well, they've done it well so far, but can they really deliver that? Mm. And I think what this has done uh, with the, the stunning result it was, it was like, OK, wow, so the money is here, which means these projects are going to happen. And that's the truth of it. I mean, why is that exciting? Well, that does mean it's better roads and schools and hospitals and transport. And that's really what state government should be delivering. And as you rightly say, though, now that we're all cashed up, we want it to happen now. Yeah, and no, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you can't do it straight, and, and that, that is part of the frustration, but we are well advanced in terms of the planning. Uh, the projects are underway. And even by 2019, this city's going to be diff very different. I mean, things like uh, Barangaroo will be almost done. The Convention and Exhibition Centre down at Darling Harbour will be done. Uh, the North Connect, so the F3 to the M2, that'll be done. Uh, the M4 expansion, the M5 duplication. Um, you know, by the end of 2019, it's a, it's a very different city and not to mention some of the hospital builds we're doing so, and schools. So it's a pretty exciting time to be in a state that's moving. The, the sale of that kind of infrastructure was, for many politicians, a, 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 a real stinging nettle. It was a, it was a career crusher, crusher for some. Then you became the, the poster boy for broadening the GST, or at least starting that conversation. That's your words, by the way. I'll just, just say listeners are clear. Just, <laughs> just so we know. But, 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 but you're the kind of leader who's quickly established himself as, as the, the kind of thinker that isn't afraid to grab a hold of something, no matter how perhaps um, uh, testing the proposition might be to a public who is, as you rightly say, really sceptical mm. about what this means. Where's the sting in the tail? You know, we understand the glory of the now, but what about further on down the track? Mm -hmm. And and things like GST, for instance, go straight to our hip pocket and all of us start to do mental arithmetic in our heads, which is why so many leaders don't lead this conversation. Why you? Well, look, I think I think it's quite simple. I think what what the community wants, of which you know I'm a member, is their leaders to say, okay, tell us, what, what, what are the problems we're facing? Don't, don't give me the the spin or don't give me the the sense of what we should do and maybe do and could do. Just tell me what are the problems and what you're going to do about it. You know, what are the opportunities and what are you going to do about it? And I think some of those honest discussions is what the community has craved for. So, I mean, something like the, the poles and wires, well, we haven't been able to fund the, the infrastructure. So tell it as it is. Um, look at the experience across the rest of the the country. Well, actually, when the private sector comes in, it's reduced the cost in these networks, which means that power bills are lower than they would be otherwise. So, you, notwithstanding the scare campaigns that can come and the political challenges that come against it, I think if you say to the people, well, this is what we're going to do and this is how it'll make your life better, or, or the life of your children better, because importantly, you can't just do the short term, you need to manage and lead, I think, for the long term. I think people will be open to that. And that might mean, such as the GST discussions, that you are actually having difficult discussions and things that will have an impact uh, on some. And not necessarily, no one wants more taxes. I mean, it's the last thing people want. But you know, do people want governments to have the capacity to fund their health services as they are for the next 10 to 15 years? And at the moment, I can tell you, it's unfunded. So you have to be upfront at that. And I think the community says, OK, well, if that's what the government is telling and let's test that and make sure they are 
telling us the truth, but if that is the truthful position, then you've got to start taking action. And that action might not necessarily be great news, but what's even worse news is something such as shutting down or closing down parts of the health system to manage within a budget because you haven't got the funding. And, you know, to me, I think that's what the community wants and that's what the public wants. And, you know, if you're not doing that as a leader, I don't think you're doing your job. Talking about family conversations as we were a moment ago about the kind of dialogue that, that I was raised in, there was always somebody, usually my grandfather, railing against the fact that we are the most over-governed country in the world. I have no idea whether that was true or not. But council amalgamations, um, one of the things that, that did surprise many when, when uh, you announced or at least started to, to offer that as, a, as a, a concept for us to digest, that we should have larger super councils, for the want of a better term, is that is that that was always going to tick some people off. Has it ticked more people off than you were expecting? And is our forced amalgamations going to go ahead? Uh, well, I mean, I think, I think before we're done, there'll be more people upset uh, because it's, it's not an easy issue. I mean, uh, having less councils, which is really what we're talking about. We're not, I mean, forget about the size. We've got 152 councils across the state, which is double Queensland and Victoria. So uh, we, we have too many councils for a state jurisdiction. So we, we need less. Um, the financial sustainability of them, we know the problems, $365 million a year we are losing. So that's not sustainable. So we need to make them sustainable. We need to make them stronger. And we need to give them greater capacity to act strategically uh, and engage across a whole level a whole number of level of government. So uh, having less councils, which means if you think about it, the, the staff who've got capability, um, well, they'll have more responsibility. Um, it's something that makes sense. You can't have a place like Parramatta Road have 10 councils up and down it. I mean, it's just too many. So, And yet regionally, there are some very large councils geographically outside of the CBD. Yep. And, and some of those councils are on that list for amalgamation. Um, geography is an enemy in that kind of environment. No, and there are some, some difficulties regionally that are, that are very unique, uh, and uh, we have to consider those as part of this. Absolutely we do. I mean, some communities a long way, very small. You know, how do you live, deliver local government in that environment? So we, we have to consider that. But, but in simple terms, it's what we're trying to do as part of this is to say, OK, is there a capacity to help the ratepayers long term in this? Um, because if you go through the proposals, over a third of councils think that they can be sustainable in the long term uh, by very significant rate increases. Um, we think, well, if you can take away the need for those rate increases so we become the ratepayers' friends, you can deliver savings, and those savings, what they go towards is either additional services, you know, so additional childcare services, I mean, uh, additional swimming pool, what is it the local community wants? Can you assure people that are hearing that their council might be amalgamated to one next door that that we'll see downward pressure on rates or will this just be another amalgamation and the rates will go up because of the debt that's already been incurred? No, so what, I mean, you have, you've got an opportunity for council to determine. So if savings come in, what would you rather do? Would you want to see rates go downward or put downward pressure on the rates with those savings? Or would you rather have additional services? And they're the discussions that are up to local councils to decide, not, not for us to decide. And really, that's a, kind of an exciting time for, for communities.